Hey guys, as promised from last week's episode, the Diving Deep Edition with Chris Allen, we've got part two coming up with Chris today. Uh, Wyatt and I uh, sat down with Chris again and just, uh, I think you'll agree in the part one, we had lots and lots of great information in part two, probably as much if not more information in part two, so uh, it's, it's a great listen, hope you enjoy, but before we get to that, real quick, out the gate, I uh, want to do a quick giveaway. Nose Jammer is a product that we have used for quite some time and fully believe in the effectiveness of it. We use it whenever we're out checking trail cameras or when we're in the field hunting. And we're going to give away a four pack, a scent control four pack combo. Comes with shampoo, body wash, uh, gear and rear wipes, deodorant and the field spray that, uh, that we use religiously out there. So all you need to do is comment, uh, share, share the, uh, this post with three friends, tag three friends on it, and uh, we're going to know that uh, you got the instructions, that you listened to this, and we're going to enter you into uh, the uh, pool to win a four-pack from Nose Jammer. Also, uh, I want to throw out there again, if you're in the uh, market for a cooler or uh, it's time to trim some uh, shooting lanes, the Wicked Tree Gear, go with Glacier Coolers or Wicked Tree Gear, go to their websites, and when you're checking out, use the promo code PROTALK for the opportunity to win, or not win, sorry, for the opportunity to get 20% off of your purchase. And here it is, uh, this is going to release the uh, first week of August or so, and in many parts of the country, it's time to start putting those uh, fall food plots out and uh, I know in our area southern Indiana that target line is right there about the first week of September so planning starts now and uh, there's lots of different fall food plot varieties you can go with out there we believe none better than anything that you can get from real world wildlife products uh, get lots and lots of messages uh, asking what should I plant what should I plant uh, it's hard to beat a deadly dozen, uh, 12 different seed types. There's a seed that's going to be, going to be palatable and, uh, and right for the deer to, uh, to eat throughout the fall from the time it starts sprouting out of the ground until uh, late winter and even comes back early spring if you plant it right. So uh, deadly dozen is a great go-to there. So uh, any questions, again, guys, feel free to inbox us, message us on Facebook. Um, check us out at protalkoutdoors.com, and we're going to roll right back into part two with Chris Allen. Hey guys, welcome back uh, to part two. Part two, we uh, we had a really good in-depth interview with. Uh, Chris Allen, and we touched on a lot of different subjects, and um, I know I, for one, why I, I kind of learned a lot in talking to Chris, and, uh, you know, Chris is not necessarily what you'd consider a household name, but, uh, man, he had a lot of great information, and there was, uh, I think I was just saying right before we recorded that I, if I, from my standpoint, if I can listen to a podcast and I can pick up on one thing that maybe that I hadn't done or that I can start doing to kind of improve my uh my hunting ability, uh, I consider that a great podcast, and I, I, when I was, you know, when we were on the podcast with Chris, and I was kind of listening to you guys go back and forth, I picked up on three or four things that I really thought was really helpful. Uh, listening to Chris, you'll definitely pick up on some, some helpful tips out in the woods. Yeah, I mean, uh, just no a doubt. great woodsman, without a doubt, and uh, so, so we're going to do part two here. Chris has been uh, gracious enough to join us again, so welcome back, Mr. Chris Allen. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you back. So let's dive into a few different, a few different topics. Uh, maybe in a little bit more depth. Um, you know, I think I think we left off um, last time we were talking about some woodsmanship type stuff. Let's start there, Chris. What What do you do when 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 you're maybe sitting at home and you're picking up a new property, or um, you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a property you've hunted for several for several years? What do you do in the off season? to better prepare yourself for the fall or maybe for the spring for the spring turkey season um what what type of preparations do you go through throughout the rest of the year to prepare you for the moment of truth you know it's interesting in, in southern indiana with with properties i mean you, you don't get big giant expanses of properties like you do in some states like nebraska out west uh south dakota some 
some of those larger states, for instance, um, you have little bitty plots of property. So you get access to this property this year, and you might get a new property next year, and you've heard that there's turkeys on it, and you want to hunt it, or you hear that there's deer, deer on it, X, Y, Z. Um, so, I mean, you're, it seems like you're hopping back and forth to this property, that property, year in, year out. Um, you have a buddy that gets access and wants to start turkey hunting this year. So, I mean, the, the time that it takes to actually learn a property uh, usually isn't there. So, one of the tools that I've used, love to use, I spend way too much time on it. Um, but Google Earth, Google Earth, anybody can get it, everybody can get it. Um, and you can really and truthfully, with, with some pretty basic concepts, narrow down where turkeys are going to hang out, where deer might hang out, um, ducks, geese, whatever. Uh, but Google Earth, Google Earth is something I use a ton. Well, I use it too, and I mean, I use it on a lot of properties that maybe I've hunted for several years. I right. mean, I'm still, I mean, you know, you're always trying to find that X. Right. And, you know, and, and, I mean, you're, and, and I think you're always trying to make next season better than the season before. No you know? doubt. No doubt. So, I mean, there, there's the first, first season, the first time you're going to hunt a property. I think it helps, number one, so that you know property boundaries, so that you know that you're on a property that you're allowed to be on. And, you, I mean, you don't want to push the envelope and be where you're not supposed to be. Um, from a safety standpoint, it's good to know kind of the lay of the land and what you're dealing Absolutely. with. A, a lot of people don't realize it, but on, I think it's in... Uh, and the options or the tools there in Google Earth, you can actually change the elevation exaggeration. Have I ever showed you how to do that? No, actually, kind of, I don't know how to do that. It's yeah. kind of sweet. Yeah. Um, place like southern Indiana where there isn't great big mountains, elevation isn't, you, you can't really see it that, that well on just right. the original Google Earth. You can actually change the elevation exaggeration to make it exaggerated, so to speak, and actually pick out these hills and hollers and valleys. Uh, in southern well, Indiana. Well, I mean, and, and, you know, we hunt some similar properties, and they're pretty flat, and there might be a little ditch or something like that that runs through them. You would never see that looking at, you know, at looking right. at a looking at a tra traditional satellite image. But with what you're talking about, yeah. I mean, that can, yeah. yeah, I want to know how to do that. Looking yeah. at this Ohio River area where, the, where it drops off from up top yeah. down to the Ohio River, it looks like a mountain. Yeah. That's how much it exaggerates things. So, I mean, I, I don't know all the statistics and data behind it, but it shows the elevation change drastically and I mean that that learning new new or going into a new property that helps out immensely uh, knowing where creeks are where where ponds are turkeys obviously I, I don't know if everybody's aware of it but if there's any kind of water source in the area uh, turkeys like roosting over water I don't know what it is yeah um, but ridge systems especially over creeks over ponds over lakes they're gonna try to roost close to that more times than not um, field edges, obviously, uh, something that you need to be paying specific attention to when it comes to deer hunting, turkey hunting. Um, but yeah, Google so, Earth. So what are you what are you looking on the property. what are you looking for on Google Earth? I mean, like, okay, so you're you're trying to pick out a property to hunt, or or figure out you're looking at the property and you're trying to pick an area to hunt on that property. Right. What type of things are you looking for? I know every property is different, but I mean, are you looking for um, funnels? Are you looking for uh, elevation changes? Are you looking for low lying ground? Are you looking for high ground? Again, it depends on the 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 critter you're chasing. Turkeys <clears throat> definitely looking for where they're sleeping. I mean, I've right. always said it. You can kill a turkey 365 days out of the year if you know where he sleeps. Um, maybe not legally, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so number one, trying to have an idea of where they're sleeping, where they're roosting, where to expect them uh, when when they wake up in the morning, and then then those travel corridors and travel corridors for turkeys a lot of times are similar to deer. Um, they're going to associate that much more to field edges and fields in general, just so they can display and attract their uh, attract their mates. Um, so field edges are obviously important. Um, one thing that Google Earth does not show you is, uh, very well is, is thickness or uh, thickness of hardwoods, thickness of just Oh, that kind of that kind of varies general. on when the uh, satellite image was taken too. Right, you know? and maturity of yeah. and maturity of. Uh, I always like looking at the uh, the images the that woods. are taken in the winter. 
Because then yeah. I think that that gives you a better idea of, of, you know, maybe where some thicker areas and stuff are. You can right. still see some green where some honeysuckle is. I, or, I do that, too. And yeah. you, you can actually, believe it or not, if, if, if you scroll back in time on Google Earth, you can look back as far as, I think, 15, 20 years yeah. in some areas. <clears throat> and um, looking, looking at those images, depending on the time of the year, usually in the fall is what you're really kind of trying to key on, you, you can actually determine what types of trees are in any specific area in that in that woods maple trees a lot of times will be a, like a like a burnt orange or a red color you can see that in october from a google earth image hickory trees will be that that dullish yellow when they start to turn down in the fall so i mean oaks oaks can be oaks can be Oaks can vary from year on year depending on the kind of moisture you get so it can be tough there heck at, it was really, really interesting. I lived in southern Illinois for a little bit, Wren Lake, and crappie fished Wren Lake quite a bit. And we noticed in the spring that there's there's a very, very select few uh, areas where there's cypress trees mm -hmm. in Wren Lake. Those cypress trees are blood red in the fall. So took the computer out, looked at Google Earth. We found that pattern on one little line of uh, cypress trees one spring. And I'm going, man. I, this lake is just so big. I haven't had time to haven't had time to fish it. I don't know where if there's any other cypress trees in the lake. I got this fancy idea. Let's look on Google Earth, and looked at that area that we'd been fishing. Saw that those cypress trees were in fact red that time of the year, in, or in October, November, and found four or five other places in that lake. Just that one little tidbit. Found four or five other areas in that lake where there are cypress trees, and went back and pounded the crappie the next couple of days. Okay, I've got to ask this, and I, I don't know if you can actually, without looking at it, because, you know, we don't have Google Earth pulled up or anything, but is there any way, just off of memory, you can kind of give some kind of description to anyone listening to this, how they can, number one, um, get that elevation change you talked about, but also scroll back in time, like you said, and, and try to find those fall images or those winter images to look at so that they can kind of see exactly what kind of trees or identify those sorts of things right I'd, i i want to say that it's in the tools and in that google earth um and again it's called elevation exaggeration you can you can pull up google earth and uh sniff around in there for a little bit and figure it out i'm sure and you want that elevation exaggeration to be on the highest level possible i think it's like a three and then apply and then you'll actually have to scroll that mouse and tilt it uh, anybody that's familiar with Google Earth will know how to tilt, but when you tilt it with this ele elevation exaggeration, your eyeballs are going to pop out because it's, it's pretty sweet how much different that lay of the land looks. Okay, so you identify the elevation changes and you exaggerate that a little bit, and let's say you go back and you find some images that you can tell somewhat what different sorts of type or types of trees are in different locations. What are you looking at then? I mean, before you even step foot on the property or, or go back out there to figure out where you're going to set up, how do you identify that X factor spot? Well, you, you usually, or I usually, I'll, I'll try to screenshot a uh, screenshot an image and I'll X a few spots. I mean, you have the, the first spot that you feel in your gut's going to be the best place to go. Um, you obviously go there and then you have a plan B, you have a plan C, X, Y, and can continue on down the line. If plan A doesn't work out, but it's it's really cool how frequently, especially with turkeys, how frequently plan A works out. Um, plan A, when I'm going into a spot first, I really really like visibility. Um, nothing nothing beats firsthand knowledge and actually being able to see that bird. Uh, so I really really like to set up over fields where I know that there's going to be visibility. Um, that elevation exaggeration again can help you. I mean, I like being high. I like being higher than than the birds. Um, obviously, can't be higher than they are if they're in a tree. But you know what I mean. You want to be in the highest spot a lot of the times. A a lot of the times you want to position yourself in a in a field edge or a field area where that sun's going to hit first. Um, I've learned that turkeys in general uh, first thing in the morning like to be in the sunny spot of the field first and foremost especially early in the year when it's cool cool, cool yeah. in the morning um, your dew's gonna burn off first in that area 
and that's where the birds want to be first and foremost. Well, and I mean, to add to that, being in that higher location, a lot of times that's a strut zone too. Mm. I mean, especially if there's visibility. Yep. You know? Yep. That's definitely why they like hanging out there. So um, do you, what, okay, so <clears throat> you're looking at Google Earth and stuff. Say you have time to, say you have time, um, you, you know ahead of time that you're going to be able to hunt this property. Do you like boots on the ground or do you solely rely on uh, the information that you get, you know, from the computer and then, um, you know, apply boots on the ground whenever you're hunting? For de- what's, let's, uh, uh, for turkeys, I don't think it's as big a deal. For deer, um, what's your what's your game plan there well with deer what what's tough about deer is you're generally trying to get in a tree and again like i said earlier uh the one thing that google earth does not do is generally distinguish between thicket uh, bushes and a big 18 inch oak that you can put a climber in so boots on the ground is quite necessary uh if you're deer hunting um unless you got some sort of previous knowledge uh from a buddy saying whether or not you can get a tree in there right Um, right you you mentioned something earlier about oh it was the the dates the time um i think it's at the very very bottom or top either at the bottom or the top or somewhere in between <laughs> <laughs> uh you can either click on there there should be a date you can click on the date and it'll allow you to scroll back in time and i think that there might be a clock uh one of the icons that actually shows a clock on it aka time and you can click on that, and it'll have a scroll bar that shows you how many. There's a little little white dot along that scroll bar that shows you where the uh, where the pictures were taken in Google Earth. And it it's not just deer hunting, turkey hunting. I, I use it more so. It seems like for waterfowl uh, than anything uh, that that time function because I want to know where the river river stages are. Um, a lot of times you're hunting flood areas. Uh, so you can look back on Noah's website and find river stages and crest yeah. crest numbers, and um, just just memory. No one, uh, hey, I know that it flooded in December and the river in 2014, was... and we knocked the crap out of the ducks back yeah. then. I, I wonder where the river was then. And you can go back on Google Earth. You're not always going to have a date that's going to be exactly landing where you want it to be. But you can go back and see where the river is, see where the bays are, the backwaters, the eddies. Um, Again, it it, it helps narrow down a hunting spot, but it's also a big, big safety item, especially when you're talking about duck hunting in January and the flood and the dark. Uh, All all the information that you have to your disposal is extremely important to stay safe out there at that time of the year. Okay, so tell us... uh... Tell us what you're going to do if you go into uh, new property for deer. New property for deer, first and foremost, again, you look at you look at Google Earth. Um, you can actually, with Google Earth, get a get a history of crops. Um, you and can look back rotation. through and see if there's any kind of crop rotation involved with the farmer. Um, a lot of times, you know, just by questioning, if you got access to the property, you've obviously talked to somebody, so you can actually... Uh, have those conversations with the farmer at that point in time but you can look back through time and see what the crop rotation looks like see if you got corn beans wheat XYZ um, and then kind of make your plan from there um, corn as most folks know is a good bedding area uh, all throughout the day for deer uh, beans depending on the time of the year is very very good forage and um, I'm, I'm a little bit more apt to sit on a field edge for deer when there's standing beans early in the season when you know they're still green. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you can gather a great deal of information on Google Earth. Again, with the elevation exaggeration, you can look at uh, bottlenecks, travel corridors, pinch points, whatever you want to call them. They're all the same thing. Uh, just, just natural travel routes that you think those deer might take. Yeah. Whether it be in a creek bottom, ridge top, um, adjacent to any kind of thicket or uh, or nasty area, and then from there, from there, I mean, again, you can take some screenshots, maybe print out some some different areas of the property, and then get your boots on the ground. And with with those maps, you might write yourself some notes, or if if you're smarter than I am, you can probably remember some things here and there, and where you might want to be. Well, let me ask you this: so let's say you identify that um, you know there is that crop rotation, you do have those 
those soybeans that you're going to have, and they're going to be green. Let's say they're going to be green that first week of October. Or, you know, if it's a state where you're lucky enough to be able to hunt September, you know, you've got those green soybeans out there. Is there somewhere you can identify with that elevation change that this is most likely the point that a big deer may enter that field? Uh, I feel like I've said it depends too many times, but it, it, it kind of depends. Um, more times than not, I mean, deer, deer associate with field edges. Um, a lot of times, or not field edges, but corners, I should have said. Corners, uh, we, we, we have all discussed swirling wind. Uh, everybody knows what swirling wind is if they spent any kind of time in the tree. A lot of times, those corners actually swirl wind toward the corner into the face of the deer. We talked about that on, on the first podcast that we had. Deer always like to have that wind in their face. Um, so again, might not be the best thing for the hunter, but that's why deer associate with corners. Uh, that, that wind will funnel in a perfectly square field, that wind will funnel to a corner. If it's coming out of the east and just depending out of the, depending on how that, that, that corner is associated, if there's a, a south to north side and then a east to west side, wind's going to funnel directly into that corner. Uh, that's why deer generally tend to use corners. Um, therefore, is considered a travel corridor. I don't. I wouldn't call that a travel corridor as much as I'd just call that a travel route. Well, and I think I think that that's uh, I think that's true. I think that anybody that's spent any time in the woods has probably recognize that um and and you're absolutely right with what the wind does absolutely yeah all right so let me ask you this um and this is maybe a little bit off topic but it's still related to deer and scouting and things of that nature what about trail cameras what do you do with trail cameras chris and let me ask you this too because I find myself fighting with this a lot. We run a ton of trail cameras and depend on them greatly. But at the same time, I kind of hate running trail cameras too because I miss the days of that element of surprise. Right. And sometimes it convolutes your... your uh, oh, without a doubt. Your, what you talked about, your, your woodsmanship. <laughs> uh, it, it causes you to second-guess yourself way too many times. Well, it causes you to second-guess yourself, and I think it also causes us to be complacent. Yeah. You know, and not and, and not be diligent and put our you know put the time in that maybe we need to figuring out a property and we rely too heavily on those cameras. Right. And I think you know myself in particular. I mean, I think in the past I've relied too heavily on uh, nighttime pictures. Tell me what's going on. Well, you know, just because the deer's moving through there during, you know, after right. after dark doesn't mean that he's going to move through there through the daylight. And it doesn't mean that he won't. I mean, I right. think it depends on right. No doubt. It depends on the area. But uh, but yeah, how how do you how do you uh, how do you use trail cameras um, for for deer scouting, maybe turkey scouting, um, and um, what are your what are your suggestions to people if they're going to use trail cameras? I, know, I don't use. I, I used to use trail cameras a lot. Um, I've had so many trail cameras stolen in the last few years. I've just got tired of buying the dang things. Um, don't get me wrong, I'd, I'll have trail cameras. I mean, I'll run four, five, six, probably eight, <laughs> maybe 15 by the end of the year when I start buying more. <laughs> right. But I, I, I like having an inventory of the deer, um, and that, that's where I get a lot of my use, knowing, knowing which deer you're dealing with, knowing the, the amounts of mature bucks in a specific property or area. Uh, it tells you what to kind of look out for, what you want to be shooting deer that might be really really close and look really really good on the hoof that you can name and uh, actually see coming and I mean there, there's a lot of three and a half old bucks that you would whack yeah, if you didn't already good. know him. Yeah exactly, exactly. Um, that's one not, thing I really like about trail cameras. I'm not saying that shooting a three and a half year old buck's bad. No. Um, my dad shoots the crap out of some three and a half year old bucks and that it, it he, makes he, him happy though he's it makes happy him tickled that. makes yeah. him happy but that that's not what i want to do specifically so i mean it just depends on uh i guess we talked about that earlier as well just depends on what what turns your crank you want to shoot uh three and a half year old deer two and a half year old deer just whatever makes you happy do it uh 
but yeah, I, I like them because you can get a good inventory, and that inventory can usually be taken and done by September. I mean, Jan or uh, July, August, Sep. I mean, that's when you're going to get your your good pictures um, and really, really be able to determine what kind of stock you're dealing with. So let me ask you this: that kind of this is kind of a question. We notice a lot of deer that move in on us, like in toward the end of October and stuff. Do you guys mm -hmm. notice that quite a bit too? We I do, like having cameras out bit. because. It, exactly what you just said it tells you what's in the area the right. one thing that we do to run cameras i don't know if this is similar to you we run them on field edges or mm -hmm. scrape you know like in in the summer we'll run them on food sources and the fall we'll put them on scrapes you 100 percent got to move them yeah 100 percent got to change things up and i was going to comment on what you said earlier that you actually get more deer different deer we usually have all our deer leave in october for some reason <laughs> they come to me <laughs> they come to you yeah that's probably accurate um, but yeah, I mean that that that's a good lesson to all that uh, a, a novice hunter might not be well aware of. I mean, you, earlier in the year, midsummer, when bucks are putting on velvet, when bucks bucks are putting on inches, they need nourishment, they need uh, they need forage, they need mineral. That's where you get your pictures. Um, their attitudes totally change, 100%, 180. Uh, after that velvet drops, they don't need it anymore, so they're going to start transitioning into feed there for a little bit. Uh, you might get them on. I think we've talked about uh, moving them to acorn flats. Yeah. Um, well, that's what I was going to say. There's October. so much stuff changing right there, right around velvet. Drop. Right. It, it's you kind know, of a crapshoot. You, yeah, you kind of got to get ahead of it, and I mean that, that's that's where spending time out squirrel hunting can help you a lot. Yeah, yeah, because you've cause, got. You've got acorns falling. You've got corn that's maybe turning ripe. Yep. You've got beans that are maybe, um, you know, turning and the leaves are falling off. I mean, there's just so many different right. things. Persimmon Every, trees starting to drop. Persimmon, you just never yeah, know. yeah. There's just so many things that are changing right there that uh, I think it's, I think a lot of times uh, for us in particular, um, you know, we think that we've lost a deer and he's gone somewhere else, but maybe he actually hasn't. Like he's just, he's maybe hasn't left our farm. He's not using the same area. Right. But he's still, you know, within the, you know, within Definitely. within the area, Definitely. you know, within close proximity. He's just his his entire day has completely and totally changed. What he's focused on and what he's feeding on, where you know where he's feeding. Their entire that. day that time of the year in early October when they when they just had a hormonal change, their their velvet change, their velvet drops off. They're getting ready to switch into a pretty interesting time of the year for for a mature buck. I mean that month long in November. He's been waiting all year long for that. So he's just their attitude is totally changing during that month of October. Um, I think I've heard statistics. Uh, maybe Auburn University. I could be wrong uh, on the university, but just the home range of a mature deer in October is very very, very small. small. Yeah. Very I think small. it might have been Mississippi State because I've read that same okay, article. Okay. But uh, it, it, it could have been all. sent that to me. But I mean, that right there will tell you where where you can screw up real quick as a hunter, as a guy that's been looking at pictures of this beautiful mature buck that he wants to kill somebody that can't stand it for the last three months in the middle of summer, totally leaves, gone, vamoose. What do you do? You try to find him, right? Yeah, and you start uh, pushing the envelope. Then you start running all over God's creation and really, really screw something up. And then you think you prove yourself right because he is in fact gone, but you pushed him out. You're the one that caused it. Um, so October, that transition period, I, I like hunting that first week of October for obvious reasons. Um, but I, I, I think that in Indiana, the way our season's situated, that first week in October can be really, really good, can be really interesting for mature deer, for mature bucks. And then I you're you're almost better off in a lot of cases unless you uh, get a major cold front or something like that. Some, cold front some big and, weather change. Unless yeah. you just got one pegged. Yeah. Um. You might really really want to back off some of your haunts, some of your some of your. So really when do you spots. when do you get back into it? Pretty heavy. Uh. Word of mouth usually tells you when when uh the, the hunting community that we have. I mean, there's a lot of guys that hunt. I mean, you, your dad. I mean, you spend just so much time. My dad spends every yeah. single day in the tree, so you know when the deer activity is going to start picking up. Uh, when scrapes start hitting the ground, uh, you you mentioned it earlier. Uh, you change that your 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 trail cam tactic tactics. 
can't talk. You change your trail cam tactics as October hits, velvet drops, and then as soon as scrapes start hitting, you better be putting your trail cameras on scrapes uh, for that first for that first part of the pre-rut, um, which is leading up to the week of Halloween and into November is when you really, really start seeing those scrapes. Well, but, and I'm assuming when you're talking about putting your trail cameras on scrapes, a lot of times you're putting them on field edge scrapes and stuff like that, not deep in the wood scrapes. Yes. And the reason you're doing that is just to continue to get that inventory yep. of what's on the property yep. that time of year. And you guys know as well as uh, we do, you know, your scrapes are going to be more frequent in by bucks than, you know, does or anything else, especially right. toward the end of October. Um, it, it's just, I mean, gosh... It's it's unbelievable. You might you know pull a camera and you'll have two hundred pictures and a hundred ninety of them are you know bucks. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. And it's on those field edge scrapes. Yeah. And those are the first ones that are going to pop up anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Those so, are kind of your community scrapes and stuff. A lot yeah. and and mostly activities after dark. I mean, unless you have you know hidden away scrape on the field, but a lot of times those are pretty chancy to get to. Mm-hmm. You know, no doubt. I mean, you're Can taking be. a big risk. And, and and that's that's something else that we haven't discussed yet. Um getting in and out to check those cameras i mean i i so what do you I, wait on do you wait on a big weather front do you wait on the obviously you wait on the appropriate wind or i, I try to yeah I, I try to for sure wait on a weather front um i like to go in as it's raining or right before it's going to rain and if that wind's right um i'm not going to sit here and say that i haven't checked it at times we when, all have yeah. when are ignorant yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh but yeah i mean you gotta, you always gotta stay focused. I mean, you always gotta keep your eye on the prize, keep your mind straight. Well, that even goes for summer time. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's important to pay attention to that type of stuff in the summer too. I think. Yep, you're always uh, hunting. Um, and again, we mentioned it earlier. I think if I think if a mature buck gets one good whiff of Mister Hunter. Things change. Things change drastically. I'm yeah. not saying that you're totally screwed him up and that you're not going to kill him. But it it it's not helping you. No, it's not helping you. Not Don't lay yourself out there. Yeah, not at all. No, so, you're absolutely right. And I mean, that's obviously you can get away with more in the summer than you can during season, right? I mean, that's. But with that said, I mean, is it worth the risk? Right. You know, that's kind of the way I always look at it. What's the risk and reward? You know, and if you screw up now, you might not get a chance to screw up later. Right. No doubt. There's there's another uh, another good way to. Uh, scout and get that inventory i mean i we used to do it before the the day and age of trail cam i know that you've done it before too not just driving around and getting to see deer out feeding in beans and and getting to see big deer here and there and having a good time driving around with the wife that's not what i'm talking about even though that's a good thing to do as well uh hint hint <laughs> spend time with your ladies um <laughs> but if, if there's an area that you know that you're hunting and those beans are getting to that right stage. It's going to happen July, early August. Go out. I mean, pick a right wind. Uh, go out and just hang out. Get you yeah. some optics. Get you some good binoculars or a spotting scope and just hang out. Shoot the bull with a buddy. Uh, watch for deer. I mean, we we've, spend we've had the... some fun, fun oh, afternoons yeah. watching fields of 30, 40, 50 deer with a good majority of those deer not majority but a good portion of those deer being bucks that are really really fun to watch yeah uh, yeah it's exciting stuff well and, and i mean we've we've had really places where we've where we've had uh similar situations go on and and <clears throat> not even put up cameras in that area because it's like well i mean what's the point like you know right. we know we know what deer it is or you know we we've seen this deer is it worth going in there putting up a camera and taking the risk of you know blowing them out because i mean you know as well as i do in the summer a lot of times they're bedding really close to that food source yeah i mean they're bedding close to those field edges you know close yep. to water whatever yep. you know but a lot of times all that kind of comes together and that's why they're coming out in those areas um so it's just you know there again i mean if, if you have an opportunity and you have a property that you can do that that's a lot of times a safer safer bet. I mean, we've got some spots that we can set, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand yards away with a spot and scope, right? And sit there and watch and see what's going on and do no that doubt. a ton. No doubt. And we were we were. Um, I don't remember what podcast it was, Dave, but we were talking about it. Another thing to do is uh, when when you have that opportunity and you get to deer social creatures, when you get to watch those deer, watch how they interact with each other. You know, if you have a deer that's aggressive in the summer, by God, he's going to be aggressive come fall. Mm -hmm. 
You know, if you have a deer that, that you know, kind of hangs by himself and just kind of seems like a loner, well, a lot of times that's what he's going to be in fall, too. Yeah, that's and a, a lot of times, like, where the, when those deer are like that um, in the summer, in the fall, or if you see a deer bedding in an odd spot, a lot of times they'll replicate that, you know, in the fall. I've seen a lot of times where those kind of loner bucks, they'll bed out in the middle of a cornfield in a little patch of woods right. or, you know, in a little drainage ditch and something where you would never think that a deer would actually bed, but he maybe isn't as social of a creature as, exactly as the rest right. of the herd, you know? Right. So it's kind of, it's just important to pay attention to those little details like that. It's really interesting where a big loner buck will bed, isn't it? Oh, my gosh, yeah. That's why he's a big loner buck. Exactly. Because exactly. he's not like the rest of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole the whole scouting from a distance on those bean fields or whatever crop field. We, we, we're, we're saying bean fields, but it could be clover, food plots, whatever you're talking about. Um, from a distance is a good way to do it. You don't get in there and stink things up. You get to see firsthand where those deer are coming in and out of Yeah. and where you might want to post your stand. Well, I mean, um, and it's a it's a good thing to do, and you know, if uh, some of our viewers have kids, I mean, it's a great way to get no kids doubt. involved. No doubt, too. You know, because I mean, they can be a little bit more loud. You can have some snacks and some drinks because you're sitting so far away. Right. You can and a lot it, of times be sitting in the truck. Yeah, and the, the sitting AC. in the truck. Yeah. So yeah, out of the and, bugs, and, so. and you know, just it's just a really, really, it's a good way to learn stuff, and it's a good way to involve um, family or maybe people, you know, that are younger, whatever. It's it's a we. I mean. You and I scout together a whole lot. Mm -hmm. We don't hunt the same properties, but we right. scout together a whole right. lot, you know. Uh, no we doubt. Hunt, we hunt similar properties and, and uh, share information and stuff. And, and, you know, that's another thing that I kind of like to bring up. Chris is uh, Chris hunts a neighboring property with us. I mean, and we share information like crazy. And it's awesome that, you know, we can do that as neighbors. And, and we don't look at it as a competition against each other. We look at it as a as a you know as a learning opportunity for each of us to to learn you know a little trick here or you know have have information of where deer's hanging out i mean there's you know some specific deer that you've hunted in the past right that you know you can ask me and say hey, have you seen this deer because he's disappeared and, and vice right. versa i mean we've conversed over that type of stuff numerous times right. and looked at aerial photos and you know it's just so it's so nice to have this working relationship i just want to bring that up you know if anybody has an opportunity to do that with a neighbor it is uh it's fantastic. I mean, you know that if you shoot a deer and it runs over on my property, you don't have to call me. Yeah. The only reason you got to call me is to have me come help you. You know, uh, and vice versa. That might happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually happened before. It has <laughs> happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From both of us. Though. Uh, so yeah, it works out really good. So. I like that first blood trail of the year. Heck, I like any blood trail. Give me a call. You know, I'm just kind of sitting back here listening to you guys talk about this, you know, scouting from a distance. And um, and the thing that enters my mind is, of course, I made, I've made this mistake many, many times over the years before I learned to not be intrusive. But how many guys out there, and, and I know that there's going to be a ton of guys that are listening to this podcast right now that are going to think back while you guys are talking about this, of all, you know, there's going to be some big deer over the years, some just absolute giant slobber knockers that they've seen, you know, throughout the summer, and then they've moved in there and tried to kill them, or they've gotten too close, or they've set up trail cameras, they've done something to get intrusive, and they've really ruined their chances before they ever got an opportunity to really hunt that deer. Well, you're sitting with two guys that have done that. I, I, well, I, that's I know, exactly right. I, mean, there's, I know there's three guys sitting on the couch <laughs> right here that have done that. But I'm sure everybody that's listening to this has done that exact same thing. And it's tempting to, you know, get in there and do that because you want to get, you know, as close as you can and, and figure things out. But you're so much better off to sit off from a distance, take a passive approach, yeah. get as much information as you can from a distance. So, I mean, that's just tremendous. I don't think we can emphasize that enough how important that is. Well, I think it's hunters. It's a simple it's a simple concept, but it's not easy sometimes. <laughs> right. Well, I think as hunters, too, I mean, we have to continue to evolve, and we have to learn from our mistakes or, you know, yeah. mistakes of our friends or neighbors or, you know, family or whoever it is, you know. And, I mean, that, that applies to life in general. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, the only way to get better is to, to hone in on what you screwed up and – try to avoid doing that again you know no, and, i mean and, we've we've brought up a ton of points here in the last 30 minutes 
and each and every one of these points that we've made is because we've done screwed it up. Oh, absolutely. We, we, we've 100%. already messed it up. Yeah, 100% But but But, but you, you, you write that in your memory banks and you try to learn from it. Maybe you don't learn completely from it, but it, it, you, you take everything that you screwed up on, basically, and uh, write that away. Yeah. Put well, it in your memory I, banks. It's, it's kind of the... The old adage of uh, "what's less is more," hmm. in in some regards with with deer, and and that's not completely and totally true, but I mean it is when it comes to intrusion, right? You know, and and I think it's tough being guys that have you know regular jobs and everything else. Sometimes it's tough to find time, and when you have time, maybe the conditions aren't right, yeah. you know, to do this or that. And sometimes you're better off not knowing, you know, what that trail camera says or, yep. or you know, what acorns are, or what trees are dropping acorns or, or whatever than you are going in there and completely and totally screwing right. the pooch for the rest of the season. You know, and like I said, I mean, that comes 100% from experience. Right. I definitely hear what you're saying about the, I mean, that, that, that time of the year, um, as you know, I mean, that's the busiest time of the year for me. I usually work six, seven days a week that time of year, 70 plus hours. So, I mean... If I'm not at work, I'm in a tree, and it's just tough. I mean, knowing, knowing how bad you want to kill that deer uh, and knowing where he might be, it's tough not taking a risk here and there and still having enough time during the right time to actually, to actually get the advantage on that buck. So, I mean, you're, you're always kind of trying to thread the needle and make the right choice and passing up opportunities here and there, but sometimes you're, you're pushing opportunities that you probably shouldn't be taking. I want to back up a little bit. And kind of kind of shift a little bit about what we're talking about. I think we touched on it just very so ever so briefly. I think uh, Chris, you mentioned this a little bit ago, but you know, talk about the different types of mast crop or native forage that is going to be available and and how it becomes available at different times of the season. And knowing where those trees are at or those native forages are, and how to capitalize on on those particular type native forages because like we were talking a little bit before we recorded here um and i know i've I've mentioned it on previous podcasts that uh honey locusts you know the pods off honey locusts and shame on me but i didn't even realize that that was a a native forage you know that that, that whitetails actually you know like to eat honey locust pods uh until last year you know we we witnessed it on several different occasions and uh, I mean, it's like candy for them. Um, so I think we should probably, and I know you've got a lot of knowledge of different type native forages and things between the two of you guys. I'd like to talk a little bit about that and how you can recognize where those are at and when they're going to become palatable for the deer and how you can capitalize on moving around and taking advantage of those things. Uh, again, it starts out with I mean, time in the woods. Uh, I, I do squirrel hunt quite a bit, not near as much as I used to and that I'd like to. Uh, but getting in the woods a little bit early, uh, obviously before deer season, just to, I mean, heck, take your binocular out in your yard and look to see if there's acorns on, on the oaks. Uh, look to see specifically what types of oaks. I mean, there are different types okay. of oak trees. Yeah, gotta, let's talk about that. I mean, because, yeah. and here's... I know I'm, I'm talking about my novice here and how much I little I know, but, you know, I mean, obviously everybody hears about white oaks and red oaks and maybe pin oaks or chestnut oaks, but, you know, chinka pins, hmm. you know, how do you identify that? And, and I didn't even realize there was such a thing, you know, until right. here recently. Right. Chinka pins, you got a bunch of chinka pins on your property. Yeah, we we've got a ton. Um, a chinka pin is gonna the bark and stuff's gonna look similar to a white oak. Um, it's not gonna be quite as shaggy, I guess, as a white oak. Um, kind of like a white oak, especially when they're mature, they'll look somewhat like a hickory. Not, right. I mean, not scaly, quite. Yeah, kind of scaly. Not quite. Not as not as sh- uh, shaggy as a shag bark hickory, but but their leaves are completely and totally different. They're more um, oval and they've got like little sawtooth grooves on it instead of looking more like a lobed. Yeah, yeah. Looking, they're less lobed like a white oak um, or a red oak or a black oak or, right, or you know right. a pin oak or whatever. Um, yeah, they're more they're more oval with a bunch of like sawtooth blades on them, and and they're to me, I mean, from what I've witnessed, and and it's 
probably relative to the property, you know. But to me, they seem to have more drawing power than a white oak does. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just what I've observed. So right. I, I don't know if that's true, you know, across the board. But um, I specifically key in on, on chinka pens. And a lot of times, chinka pens and white oaks um, are here locally um, where we hunt. They, they drop at different times. Um in, in, throughout the season, chinka pens usually seem to be a little bit sooner than the mm-hmm. than the white oaks. Um, from what I've noticed, what about you, Chris? I mean, I did the, a lot of the places that I hunt don't have too many chinka pens, but I've definitely seen uh, hunting up around Hoosier National, Washington County, the the chinka pens, the swamp white oaks. There's a difference between a swamp white oak and a and a white oak. Um, but yeah, those those chinka pens definitely drop a little bit early, and like you said, the deer prefer them. Not saying at all that. The deer's not going to eat a white oak, but I, it's really, really interesting about the, the preference. Yes, no doubt, no doubt. The the, 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 the yeah, actual... well that yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is how do you if you're looking at the acorn, if you just kind of hold a chinka pin versus a white oak in your palm of your hand, right? What's I mean, is there am the I going to be able to tell the difference in those two? The white oak is a they're very, very similar. I, I forget what the little the, basically the cap are very similar. Uh, the white oak, the straight white oak, is a little bit more, more elongated o- oval of an more, acorn. Yeah, that's a lot more elongated. Yeah, um, it would almost remind you of a uh, chestnut oak, kind of. Mm. Maybe not quite as big. Right. A white oak. Right. Um, which I, I I wasn't super familiar with chestnut oaks until a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we don't have any on any of the properties that I've ever hunted, um, but I was doing some scouting with a friend, and he had something. I was like, "What is this?" You chestnut know? And oaks. Got, yeah, yeah. Okay. I got to uh, got yeah, to looking around and looking it up. Yeah. There's yeah. not many of them. I mean, I, I forget how many uh, actual oak trees that there there oh, are there's in this midwestern yeah. Indiana. I mean, there's bur oaks, chestnut oaks, chinka pens, pen oaks, black oaks, red, white oaks, red oaks. Uh, it, it's Tip- crazy. Typically, but typically what I typically what you're you're discussing are chinka pens, like Wyatt mentioned, uh, white oaks, red oaks. I mean, those those yeah. to me are your biggest three, your main three. I could be totally wrong. Off base, there's probably people in northern Indiana thinking I'm an idiot right now. But that's what we got for the Locally, most part Locally, though, here. I mean, that's what we're yeah. focusing in on. And right. and what what I've observed uh, in the last 20, 25 years, um, white oaks, white oaks can be very, very good. Um, white oaks are a preference, I feel like. But one problem, uh, not necessarily a problem, but... An issue, something to keep in mind, as a lot of times when you have a good white oak crop, you have white oaks everywhere. Everywhere. That's what Too I was many. just getting ready to say, Too and I think that them. that's maybe why chinka pens have a tendency to maybe have a little bit more drawing power, mm. is because there's not as many. I mean, we have we have properties with some, but we still don't have as many white oaks. Right. Um, and and um, you know, I think it's I think it's relative to the time of year that somebody's hunting. Right. Too. I mean, your chinka pins and your white oaks are going to drop earlier. You know, starting in September into October. Yep. And then you know, then your red oaks are going to come come on middle to end of October. Correct. So there's going to no come and and they're the least preferred. So if you're later in the year, there's going to be more red oaks and black oaks and stuff like that on the ground than there is white oaks and chinka right. pins because they've all been eaten up. Right. You know. Um, so I mean, it's all relative as to the time of year that you're that you're hunting. I think that age, age of the tree, again, this is just from experience. I've noticed that if if you do have a good mast year, uh, there are a lot of white oaks, and you're hunting in an area with a ton of white oaks, uh, one might think, where the heck do I hunt, right? Um, I, I've noticed that deer will actually pinpoint larger, more mature, mature trees. Um, never eaten a white oak personally, so I don't know if they're s- sweeter on the bigger trees or or right. more yeah. nutritious. nutritious or what. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I've 100% noticed that. And I think that they drop a little bit earlier, too, those big mature trees. So maybe they're just pinpointing them earlier. I don't I know. I agree with that. I mean, and you know, or I noticed that, you know, squirrel hunting with hickories. Yep. Too. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's there's the same. There's something to it. Yeah, there's something to it. Those bigger trees, they'll drop earlier, and they'll, I mean, you know, they go out usually, are. yeah, poke For around sure. the week or so before squirrel season just to see, you know, what trees are dropping, and those big ones, they're they're dropping way before the you know the smaller ones are average size ones. Right. So, um, the other thing though to that to that point, and you're talking about white oaks being spread, you know, kind of everywhere, and and you know finding a place to pinpoint, um, and you know looking for a big tree. 
Um, that is absolutely true if you're just in a big acorn flat. Yep. I also think, though, that your closest trees to bedding areas, mm-hmm. that, you know, a buck can get up. Kelly shot a really nice buck. It's that one right up there. Um, first one that she ever killed with her bow. Um, and we got tied into the bedding area. It was a chinka pin. She shot him in the morning. It was like October 13th. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I mean, he didn't have to go 50 yards from his bed right, right. to, right to a white oak. There was a tremendous amount of white oaks, I mean, on that whole ridge, mm-hmm. but that was the closest one. It was kind of, it was kind of, um, isolated, you know, I mean, there were some other, some other trees and stuff around yeah. there. It was kind of like that first one and it yeah. was hot and, you yeah. know, it just, yeah. it, everything aligned, but that is probably as important, if not more important, especially when you're mature or targeting mature deer, yeah. you know, finding that finding maybe some of those trees or a little grove of trees that are that are isolated and close to bedding or close to a travel corridor or close right. to water you know something that that kind of gives them a an edge again like we said earlier that time of the year a lot of times they don't move much if no, they, especially not. if they don't have to yeah and, and that makes it tough and, man and it actually it, i mean that that it's the best time of the year to really, really screw up a big buck. I'll be honest with you. I I would much prefer, just from a hunting standpoint, for you know, for a successful hunting standpoint, right. I prefer the years where we don't have acorns because yeah. it really focuses the deer in on uh, agriculture. And right. That makes it a lot easier because I can be put a, a lot less pressure on the deer because I can hunt field edges. You and know, I don't, I don't know now. What... I mean, with with that said, it's 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 creates a ton more forage for right. the for all animals when there are acorn crops so it's not like right. i'm you know wishing all acorns to never right. pollinate again and or, you know oak trees to never pollinate ne- pollinate again and you know we wouldn't have any acorns i don't wish that at all but i think from a hunting standpoint it's a heck of a lot easier I, and you know and i you know i complain about it too i'm like oh there's no acorns this year and everybody right. complains about it but i mean right. in reality it's it's helpful in some regard i, I... I definitely have had better success on low mast years hunting around red oaks, because a lot of times that there are not white oak well, acorns, and that's, there it, will be red oaks, yep. and they are the only acorns in the woods. Well, in a lot of years when there's a bunch of white oaks, there's not red oaks. They kind of cycle. They do. You know, do. Now, but the red oaks, I think, produce right. more consistently I, than the I'd white say, oaks around here. I, that's exactly right. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that the years that they're a good mass, you're going to have red oaks and white oaks. The, yeah. the bad mass years, you're still probably going to have some red oaks. Yeah. And those are the years, again, I mean, the, the years that you have good mast, those deer can get a meal anywhere. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they, they're spread out. They're not they're not pinpointed in one area. The years that there's a bad, poor mass crop, a lot of times you can find a good red oak cropping. The big one I shot three or four years ago, that's what was going on. Yeah. I mean, it was a bad mass year. Yeah. And yeah, I, but there, there was just a couple. Were, I, I think that there, there was one big white oak, a giant white oak, that had, that had acorns falling. One of the only white oaks in all my squirrel hunting that I had found that had acorns on it. And then two or three red oaks that were dropping as well, starting to drop. Again, it was early October. But, I mean, that that's why I was so pumped up about that spot. Just because, I mean, I, 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 all the stars were aligning. I, there was no reason for there to be three or four trees with acorns on them that year. But I found them, and they were all in the same spot. Yeah. So, I mean, it's those kind of super sweet spots that, that you gotta that, that you, you gotta, gotta try to pick out yeah. yeah well i mean and you can and here's the thing too i mean that's something that i look for a lot in shed season you know because i can get up into up into areas that i don't want to walk around in before season and you, you can pretty much figure out i mean if you if you can look at if you can look at acorn trees and and say it's a good mass year um you can just about and they have acorns on them you can just about bet that they're gonna you know that the trees that you found that are maybe secluded they're right. going to have, you know, they're going to have some, right. some mass on them. Now, I mean, catching them dropping at the right time, it's a whole nother, right. it's a whole nother thing. But And again, that it was a point that you made about 10 minutes ago and a point that I just made that we talked about last podcast. I mean, it, you always got to be thinking of circumstantial uh, type deals. I mean, the, like I said, those two or three trees were in that one little area. There weren't any other acorns and weren't any other oak trees in that specific area. There was bedding in the area. There was water. There was everything that deer needed. The the biggest thing that uh, was was away from that whole equation was food, and I was sitting on the food. Um, so it, it's very very similar 
um, elsewhere so, with oaks. So let me ask you this, Chris. Like, you know, trying to trying to digest all this information, you know, when you're out there, do you and something I do a lot of times, I carry a little notebook with me. Mm. I'll carry it in the tree stand with me uh, when I'm hunting. Sometimes I'll take some notes or I'll take notes, you know, maybe when I get back home, when I'm checking trail cameras, I'll take notes on different deer, right. um, different things. Uh, you know, shed hunting, I usually have a little notebook and I'm looking at rub lines, I'm looking at scrape lines, and I'm looking at, you know, trees and travel corridors, and there's maybe a tree that's fallen over on this point, so I know it's going to redirect deer, you know, deer movement and traffic you know do you is that something you try to do as well or do you i I should do it i should do it more often than i do if 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 i see something like that while i'm hunting um sometimes i'll send myself an email i usually don't translate that into notepad and paper as as frequently as i should one thing that i started doing a couple years ago um is, is is experimenting a little bit with moon guides and moon phases and i took it a little bit further this last year um, cross-referencing t- trail cameras uh, pictures on trail cameras with again I mean on the on the far left hand column I've got the moon phase um, obviously the date associated with the moon phase and then statistics for that day whether I hunted or not mm-hmm. uh, was kind of irrelevant I mean I, I've got a place on the far right for comments if I hunted if I if I saw deer on this this or that day or if I checked trail cameras and noticed a buck, a mature buck during the daylight on this day, but I have a ton of statistics, weather statistics, right. for that specific right. day on that moon phase. Now I'm starting to learn that moon phase has got a little bit to do with it, maybe, um, but but pressure is on there. Pressure is huge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, overcast, cloudy, sunny. Sky conditions, obviously. Temperature is big, and temperature, um, as according to that time of the year, if it's if just how that works with that time of the year. Right. Um, any kind of weather systems moving in or out, which is also barometric pressure. Um, but just any kind of, uh, there, there's more to that spreadsheet. I kind of wish that I had it pulled up at the moment, but, I mean, you, you start to see some patterns. Um, again, wind direction is very, very important, and... On that that comment section, I kind of alluded that that comment section wasn't that important earlier. It kind of is important because that's that's firsthand personal knowledge, personal experience, time in the field, and that's where information like you saw this deer, that deer, he was traveling north northerly with a wind out of the north. I mean, that's it's that kind of stuff that you need to log into your memory books. Um, you can write little notes on where you think he might have been betting. Uh, just just to try to just to try to develop that story, develop that uh, that pattern for that specific deer, for a group of deer, well, or a spot. No doubt. Yeah, and, and not even not even specific deer, but you know, and, and that's something that when we had Mark Drury on the podcast, we talked about pretty much in depth was how weather, how moon, uh, frontal systems, barometric pressure, mm. all that stuff will affect movement, but also you know, annually, year to year, and not even just, you know, it may be, um, you know, 10 years ago, you had a mature buck that, you know, traveled a certain route, or, you know, kind of like to bed in a certain location, right. uh, you know, hit fields in a certain, um, you know, a certain manner, and another big deer will move in and kind of take that same, um, you know, that same, I guess, pattern. Pattern, more yeah. or less, yeah pretty much do the same thing but but before we get i don't want to you know i know we talked in depth about oaks and you know that type of massed crop um what's what's some other type of native forages that you kind of look at that you know you've noticed maybe that that the average guy doesn't really pay attention to out there but deer will feed on yeah there were a bunch that we didn't that we didn't mention um this again is is something that comes from walking around first-hand knowledge uh it's hard to tell if an area is full of multiflora rose or honeysuckle if you're just looking on google earth i mean those are two specific items right that that i would log in my memory books as as a potential area to hunt uh those deer when you're watching them walk around and walking walking around in the woods um they're always eating yeah they're browsing the whole time browsing I mean, browse. I'd, 
don't know statistics, but I would I would venture to say that a, the vast majority of what is in a deer's diet is just in fact browse, and browse is is a uh, carpet term for honeysuckle, multiflora rows, limbs, twigs, uh, sapling trees, things of that nature. Basically, just undergrowth that is at the height that they can pick and eat. Right. Um, so. Th- those areas can be little super sweet spots, secret spots, um, that can definitely be overlooked. Are those are those areas that have potentially been logged in the past that have a real, real good lush green uh, undertow um, at that three foot, four foot, five foot area that that deer can pick real easily. I mean, I've had some really, really good uh, it seems like the, that middle of the day, middle middle morning time frame is when the deer really, really start coming out of ag fields and just kind of uh, slouch around and they, they really browse hot and heavy. Some will bed, some will, some will slow down and just stove up basically. Others will be browsing around and eating, gouging themselves. Um, I've had some really, really good hunts middle of the day in some, some areas that are just full of uh, multiflora rows and and honeysuckle so i know we, we've mentioned um you know multiflora rose we've mentioned honeysuckle of course the mass crops with the oaks uh we've mentioned um um honey locust pods mm-hmm. i mean you guys were talking a little bit about a particular deer uh off air i think that was i think it was before we were recording um what what was he feeding on it was a big deer I, was it was it ragweed did you say was wasn't it? Ragweed. Yeah. Yeah, it was ragweed. There was actually a field right next to our lease in the area that uh, Wyatt hunts that, I mean, this, this deer is one that I've hunted for the last couple, three years, a couple years definitely. Uh, this will be the third year since I choked on him last year. Um, but there was just a plethora of crop fields. There were a ton of deer eating in bean fields that were to this deer's disposal, but this deer would not be seen in a bean field. He was in, there, there was a field that, uh, again, directly adjacent to a bean field that all the deer were eating in, and this one would hang out day in, day out in the ragweed and was never seen outside well, of it. And typically he was by himself. Typically was by himself. Well, you know, away from all the other deer. No bachelor group. I nope. mean, all the all the yep. other bucks were bachelored up. This guy was by himself, yep. maybe with a doe or two. That was it. Yeah. And, I mean, in a oddball spot. I mean, yep. just in general. I mean, yep. very secluded, you know, no pressure, just. Uh... I mean, have you guys seen any other deer feeding on ragweed? I mean, oh, to me, that, yeah. I, yeah. That, that's that's yeah. a new one on me. I, I really yes. haven't. And here's another thing. I'm not sure I could actually identify ragweed. I mean, what, what would somebody be looking for if they see, uh, you know, what's a bunch of ragweed look like? It kind of looks like a juvenile tomato plant. Yeah. That's a good and, way to describe yeah, it. Um, uh, that would be the easiest explanation. And, yes, we have seen a lot of other deer feed on ragweed. Um, you know, we have some rag we have some ragweed that comes up in some of our clover pots and stuff like that. I mean, and they just mow it down. I mean, it'll be mowed down just like the clover is. Now, typically we spray it, you know, because it, it gets killed right. when we spray, spray, you know, 2,4 dB or whatever, you know, probably to kill it. spray your yeah. clover and keep the ragweed. Yeah, 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 you probably could. Yeah, I mean, but it, it is... Uh, it's amazing, yeah. I mean, it'll be it'll be quipped just as low as the clover, and and honestly, that's the that's the way that we figured it out. My dad and I were over there a few years ago, um, checking uh, checking some clover pots, and we were looking. We're like, what what's this rag? What's up with this ragweed? Why didn't you know all the other milkweed and um, you know uh, mare's tail and everything else is you know growing taller, and the wag- ragweed, I mean, is clipped the exact same height, nipped off, nipped off just like the clover is. Okay, so now I've got this question here. Is the ragweed something that the deer will feed on throughout the summer, or is it like uh, one of those things like a frost has to hit it before they start eating it, or is there any certain time frame? Well, I mean, there's a time frame because it's a weed. So, I mean, it, they start to peter off pretty good, you know, toward the end of summer. Right. Um, it, it, you know, so it it is a it's a spring, late spring, summer, maybe... Yeah, in the September-ish. early fall, September. I mean, it just September-ish depends kind of on your on you your to... year. But yeah, I mean, it's not a 
it's it's not going to be there in December or November. About the time that they drop their velvet. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's about that time frame when, yeah. when you lose them on it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I would say that's consistent. Yeah. So. It's just, eh, it's just kind of neat. I mean, you know, it's just from looking and watching and trying to pay attention. Right. But, it's interesting what you pick Yeah. Out. I mean, we, we were, I think we were together last year when we first saw that big deer in that yeah, ragweed field. About we were like, what is he doing? And then, you know, we got to look and we were like, oh, there's a bunch of ragweed out there in this grown up field that just never got planted. Right. So, I mean, so then it was super was easy to figure smoking out. Smoking it, too. Yeah. Every night he was smoking it. Yeah. So. He was very visible. That he was. That Make he was. Slobber. Okay, so that, that's another type of native forage. Is there anything else that you guys can think of that we haven't touched persimmons. on? That, yeah, persimmons. Yeah, persimmons, are obviously. Obvious. Persimmons are easy to pick out too. I mean, their their bark is pretty streamlined and a little bit grooved, textured, if you will, and obviously the the big orange fruit hanging from them. And um, I mean, I, I haven't spent a lot of time having the opportunity. I mean, a lot of the farms that we hunt don't have a plethora of persimmons, so I can't. I mean, I've shot a few deer here and there. Um, haven't done too much inventory trail cameras with persimmons. I don't know how how much big mature type bucks. I know that does just pound the heck out of them. Um, and I've heard of guys shooting nice deer under persimmon trees, but I, I know that one of the trees that we planted in this uh, this plot behind mom and dad's house is, I think we planted 100 persimmon trees. Yeah. Um, so hoping that some of those come up and that so you'll little, have boy, five. <laughs> little, little boy Lucas will be able to kill his yeah. first deer on one of those persimmons persimmon trees the th you were asking about mature bucks and stuff feeding in persimmon trees um i've run cameras in the past i don't so much anymore on persimmons and yes uh definitely get mature bucks on them the problem that i've seen with persimmons here locally like where we're at most of them are in the trees that i've hunted Sims. well yeah possums yeah which always fool you because they sound like a big buck because they, they like walk giant <laughs> they walk very deliberately and then they stop and then they walk very deliberately yeah, yeah. but uh it, the pr the problem is most of them are gone uh, by the time season even opens. That's exactly so, right. So um, now, if you had a big gro grove of persimmons and had a lot, um, yeah. then I could see that being incredibly effective. Right. But you know, for for us in the in the in the spots that you know we hunt, that's just not it's just not a viable right. option. So right, a lot of them drop. You sure. you can tell us in ten fifteen years. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. How it goes. <laughs> yep. If we're not killing deer and eating back straps, we'll have persimmon pudding. Well, that sounds like a win-win, really. I reckon. Okay, well, what about this? Have you guys, and you guys may not have these on your farm so much, but what about pawpaws? Yeah, they eat them. I mean, they don't have hardly any. I mean, I, I we don't. We planted 100 pawpaws, too. I don't feel like that pawpaws in, in, on the farms that I've hunted in the past are like a preferred type food source right. necessarily not as much as as i would would have thought that they would be i mean right. i've hunted some pretty good pawpaw patches in the past and you know you have some deer come through and feed on them but it wasn't like they were hammering them as much as i thought they would right i think it would be interesting to know what the other available food sources were like the years that you were hunting i mean was there a good mass crop was there you right. know was there viable beans you know at that point in time close by you right. know was there a clover patch or, or persimmons or whatever else i mean yeah i think it's all relative i mean it's just like ragweed i don't know that ragweed is a preferred um you know i, I don't know that deer are going to ragweed over acorns or uh, right. well obviously they're not because of the time of year but i don't know if they're going there over you know fresh beans and uh right. and and clover and stuff like that but they eat it in conjunction and to some degree you got you got to think i mean i could be totally wrong i'm not a deer psychologist or anything but i mean to some degree you got to think that some deer have preferences of some forages over others i mean just like people. that you yeah. would, you would think so um so i don't again don't know if there's any kind of science to that uh, but it's a percentage thing. I mean, 90% of the year are probably going to feed on beans that time of the year. The other 10 might like ragweed or persimmons, whatever. You just you just never know. It's just spending the time outside and knowing, uh, trying to gather the inf information uh, on which deer you want and what that deer is, in fact, That's eating. That's, oh gosh, I'm screwing up the mic. That's exact. Check. That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, it's it's knowing what an individual deer wants. I mean, they're they're all different. I mean, you know, they're they're like people in some regards. I mean, they all have a different personality and things of that nature. 
Um, it, it's 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 just like that big buck you were talking about. Yeah. It, it, there wasn't a lot of deer feeding on ragweed right then. Right. But you wanted to hunt that specific deer. I did. He was. I did. You know, so, I mean, therefore, that would have been a viable thing to target. Yep, no doubt. And ended up later on in the year kind of almost working out. Not in the ragweed situation, but on that specific deer. Well, I mean, that's just, that's an interesting topic. And back to your question there, Wyatt, the pawpaw patch that I hunted, that was just long enough to know, long enough ago, that I wasn't smart enough to keep good inventory and and keep track of what actually was out there at the time. So, you know, I I don't really have any good statistics on that. But I just know it didn't work out real well for me. Even though I know they were feeding on them, it just didn't, you know, help out a whole lot. What about, have you guys had any kind of uh, success or have you noticed um, the leaves off of beech trees? Anything I, like I that? know beech trees or sycamores. I, I don't or, know what it is about beech trees. I, I, they must turn into some sort of a cocaine type substance because squirrels just absolutely love them. When those when those beech trees, those beech nuts, um, start to mature in that late Septemberish time frame, early October, if you're a squirrel hunter, you want to be finding some beech trees. Yeah. The squirrels get in them and they just are ignorant. I mean, you can you can find a squirrel with eight or ten, or you can find a beech tree with eight or ten squirrels in it, and kill every one of them, and they'll keep eating. They don't care if you're shooting their buddies out or not. They keep eating. And turkeys are the same way. Turkeys love beech trees. I don't know how many people fall turkey hunt, but if you fall turkey hunt, you better find the beech trees that are dropping. Um, haven't really witnessed deer eating beech nuts too much. Well, not uh, the beech nuts, the the actual leaves when they fall. And and here's here's the situation where I have seen that happen a lot. And, and look, Todd Harbin just walked in. There's Todd. He's, he's going to come and join us on the podcast as well. But no, I, I've noticed like uh, areas where I've been on like uh, military refuge hunts or something where, you know, like big oaks where you've got vast expanses of hardwoods and you have zero ag anywhere near. Right. That makes um, sense. You know, I've keyed in on some, uh, you know, beech tree groves where, you know, the leaves are through there, you know, this, you know, the leaves are dropping. Um, and I've seen, you know, I've seen the deer eating those up pretty right. good. And that makes sense. Again, that kind of, uh, that brings up a good point. I mean, we, we've been talking about southern Indiana where ag is very, very prevalent and there's always a bean field or a corn field close by. I mean, some of these big, giant expanses in uh, like Hoosier National, Clark State Forest, for instance, where there isn't very much ag, uh, what you're saying is potentially key, extremely important, because it is those natural forages that those deer have to key on I mean, that, that's all they know. That's all that they can eat. They don't have the ag fields um, like we do around here. One thing that I have noticed about beech trees, if you have a good grove of beech trees or a, uh, a specific beech tree that's, that's quite brushy, that's large, you're going to have scrapes under it. Those beech trees point. don't drop. They don't drop their leaves until January. They're the tree in the woods that's going to hold on to their leaves the longest. And they just love putting scrapes down. Why do you trees. think that is? Do you think it's a scent thing? Because that their scent stays on that leaf longer than it stays on just the stays leaf on the leaf, and and the, other leaves don't cover up that scrape. It right. keeps that scrape fresh. Okay, that's again, an I'm interesting. Not, again, I'm not a deer psychologist. Yeah, but that's my thoughts. It ke- it keeps that scrape open. That's it. That's the interesting. Foliage over the top of it keeps that, it open. The only thing that I was considering was just it continuing to have the weeds and you know keeping that scent on yep. it a little longer. There, but but that makes sense that it is. Uh, it's because of keeping that scrape open as well. I've actually I've actually pinpointed spots simply because of beech trees before. I mean, if there's if there's different breaks in properties, uh, this one specific property that I hunt has got a pretty good size mature woods, and then another woods that it's very obvious straight line has been logged. And there's beaches that grew up in that area that's logged, and it is a direct, straight, perfect line of beaches. And there is a 100% scrape line along that beach beach grove annually. I mean, a perfect straight arrow line along those beaches. And you know where you put your tree? Right at the end of it. That's very interesting. Okay, so we've talked a lot about scrapes. Let's talk about rub lines. Do you have any... 
do you pay attention to rub lines a whole lot? I mean, I know that's something. I've read lots of things about rub lines. I can honestly say I've never really concentrated on hunting rub lines. Um, is is that something that you even put into play at all? Uh, I mean, if you walk into an area that's just absolutely shredded uh, with rubs, um, might make you feel like it's a bedroom. One of those areas you might actually want to stay out of. <laughs> yeah, um, it, like you shouldn't be there. Yeah, you probably shouldn't be there. Um, but rubs, I mean, I'd, you, spending time in the woods, you see more deer working scrapes than you do actually making rubs. So that tells me that you need to be on scrape lines. I could be wrong. I'm sure that somebody's wrote a book about it at some point in time about hunting rub lines. I know that there's signpost rubs. Uh, that show up year after year annually that can tell you whether or not uh, the big mature bucks in the area and whether he's marking his territory. What 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 are your thoughts, Wyatt? Well, I, the the thing that I like to do with rub lines is not necessarily look at them during the season, but post season, yeah. and it tells me which way and which direction you know a, a deer's traveling. That is, a good it's point. likely that he's coming out of his bed and he's ha- heading toward agriculture or something of that yeah, nature. You that's know? a good point. And it kind of that is how I guess that I hunt would hunt a rub line is from the previous season's rub line mm-hmm. in which direction you know that the animal was yeah. was traveling. And it, it is true. I mean, there are certain areas that you're going to consistently have rubs in. Right, you know, and a lot. Can, a lot of times, it can help you know the travel direction. It's a travel of, corridor, exactly. Basically. Yeah, yeah, and um, and that's that's how I I don't necessarily look at a rub and say I'm going to set over this rub. Right, it's not what I'm doing, but like I'm I'm taking rubs from from the year previous, or or maybe even rubs that I can see when I'm hunting. Like you were saying, a lot of times if you're getting right in the middle of a bunch of rubs, you probably shouldn't be there. I mean, depending on this depending on the right. scenario. If right. you're on a rub line, you know, obviously headed thing. toward agriculture, that's a little bit different than right. walking in and there being five rubs in a circle in a bed right from, in the from middle 15, of them. from 15 different directions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then you can figure that okay, well that's where that's where he's bedding. Yeah, but um, just screwed up. But at the same time, I mean, if you do run into that situation, you do screw up, use that to your advantage. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, mark that down. Right. Because if a big buck's bedding there one year, even if he doesn't make it, it's likely another big buck's going to bed there the following year. Or maybe it's going to be the year after that or the year after that. I mean, there's a reason why that deer was was bedding there. And it'll be duplicated. And it will be duplicated by the next big buck that, you know, takes his place. No doubt. For sure. Todd, you got any thoughts on that? I think y'all hit them all. You know, took everything out of my mouth. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I hear you. We've, you know, Todd just walked in. But we've we've discussed a whole lot of stuff today. Um, but I feel like, we, you know, I feel like I want to keep, keep talking here. Yeah. I mean, there's so many more things we can talk about. One, one thing specifically I want to talk about um, to Chris is about being a conservationist and some of the conservation efforts him and his family's making to, uh, he was talking about the persimmon trees and the pawpaws and things right. like that that they were planting. I want to kind of dive into that scenario um, and figure out what you guys are doing and why you're doing it and, you know, kind of the, the whole mindset behind that. Yeah, well, mom and dad, they, they don't have too awfully much property at all. I mean, it, it's enough property to kill to kill deer on, kill turkeys on, but they've, they've only got 15 acres. But it, it's kind of a prime example that you don't have to have 200, 2,000 acres. You, I'd rather actually, have the right two acres than, you know, the wrong 200. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, but, I mean, you, you don't let small tracts of property limit yourself and l- limit what you can give back. Um, we actually, I think it's, it's the EQUIP program. It's E-Q-I-P, and that that's specifically for the state of Indiana. Other states probably have uh, similar type programs. I believe it's with NRCS, Soil and Water Division. Um, Mom and Dad have had this property for 15 years. It's been pasture slash hay. Uh, not a whole heck of a lot you can do with it as far as agriculture goes. It's highly roll highly erodible is how the land's classified so uh called up soil and water office there in clark county and just started asking questions and um the folks there told us about this program um that we could actually 
apply. Uh, it was an application process, and they actually had to come out, look at the property, um, see if it qualified, which it did, obviously. And then there's there's a multitude of different options. Um, trees we planted. We planted, I think, 10 or 12 different types of trees. Um, how many trees? How many? We yeah, planted you you on, mentioned 100 persimmons. We planted 1,300 total. Wow. So we planted... Uh, we planted northern white cedars, hawthorns, red buds, uh, flowering dogwoods, uh, elderberry, um, a lot of forage type trees, a, a lot of trees that that deer and wildlife in general. It's not specifically for deer or turkeys. The big, the big uh, game. It's it's actually, believe it or not, it's pheasants forever, uh, quail unlimited, um, that are involved in this specific grant. Um, but the, again, the the there were two different individuals with uh, with the county, or actually state individuals. I believe they're state employees that came in and looked at our property, um, talked over with Dad and I what the possibilities were, uh, what our options were, uh, yay or nay on trees, yay or nay on um, CRP type ground. It's not classified CRP like the CRP program or WRP program in the state, um, but but that type of planting. Um, little blue stem. There, there were two grasses, three grasses. I think there were uh, there was like an oat, uh, oat grama, um, little blue stem, switchgrass, and then there were um, like 30 different forbs and legumes that we planted as well. Um, so planted trees on the outsides and along the uh, field edge, and then in the heart of the field, which was probably four and a half, five acres. We planted this this multitude of thirty different legumes, forbs, grasses, and then also had uh, fire breaks. Basically, I mean, this type of uh, property you have to prescribe burn it basically every two or three years, I think, uh, to reseed. Um, and then you plant clover, fire breaks in between uh, these big expanses of grasslands. That's extremely interesting. Okay, so. Um so you you went through the application process, mm -hmm. and now I'd imagine that is a very expensive undertaking with that amount of trees being planted. And, and I know switchgrass, blue stem, those are not cheap type seeds to put out right, there. Right. Very expensive. Is that something that you know after you got accepted into the program? Is that something the state paid for those seeds, or do they give you money back for you planting those type seeds? Dad's covering most of it, um, handling most of it, I should say. But from what I understand, again, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of the work. So, I mean, we don't have contractor fees or anything like that. We, luckily, we got a network of friends, farmer friends, that help us with all that. And um, planted all the trees ourselves and actually had a buddy come in and plant the grasses and leg the legumes, all the seed. Um, but got the trees from a local nursery up in Valonia and the seed heck we got it just in Scottsburg here close half hour away and I want to say that the, 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 the actual money that is given back to us I, I believe we have to require or that we have to provide them with the receipts um, but it's basically going to cover all the seeds and all the trees and it, it, wow. it again it's not like CRP or WRP where we get reoccurring payments year after year for acreage uh, it's just a spot payment one time um, but again, it's basically paying for it. And obviously, the money part of that is not why you guys do that, obviously. No but I wanted to mention that just because there may be somebody out here right now listening that may have 15, 20 acres, and they may not realize that there's some options there for them to actually do something with their property, get it involved in a program, and, and it doesn't. it's not going to cost them several thousand dollars out of their pocket to do that, and it's going to be great for the wildlife and conservation. And, and, and we're not just talking deer and turkey, like you said. I mean, it's great for, you know, songbirds, uh, yeah, songbirds, songbirds quail, uh, quail, you know, quail everything. Quail have had a hard way to go here lately. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and there's a lot of other programs out there, too. I mean, not just what Chris did. I know um, I looked in, and I looked into the pollinator program doing that here at um, – 
at you know the family farm here and unfortunately um the in- indiana had met their uh, amount of people that had signed up you know when i looked into it but uh that was actually like reoccurring payments i mean it was like leasing your ground for crops and it was a lot of uh it had clovers and then uh a lot of uh warm season grasses and, and right. things like that um and that was strictly for the bees which i mean the bees are incredibly important you know, I, and, a lot more and important than people realize. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and it's something that is is really been taking a beating here the last several years. Um, yeah. They're just they're not the bees that they once were. Um, so that's a really good program that the government's putting on, and and then like you were talking CRP and was it WRP or something? Right, wetland yeah. reserve. Yeah, the yeah. wetland. So yeah. When, yeah. when it all boils down to it, I mean, each each specific property, depending on the soil type, uh, the erodibility, just the lay of the land, so to speak. Uh, is going to classify you in different areas of a governmental program or state program. So the only thing, I mean, w- what you need to do if you're thinking about it is get in contact with Soil and Water, um, Soil and Water, or your local extension office, and just just feel them out. Just have that conversation, and uh, maybe set up an appointment and have them come out and look at your place, and they'll they'll lead you in the right direction for sure. Well, I, I mean, I think that the thing is, is that that I'm taking away from this is that there's a lot of folks, there's a lot of programs out there, um, and there's some federal and state money available to help people help wildlife. So, I mean, it's right. a win-win, and kudos to your family for checking into that. And, yep. and uh, you know, it's a lot of effort. And, I, I mean, we know we just, you know, we're, we're planting food plots, you mm-hmm. know, um, and that takes a lot of effort. And it's not doing near as much for the wildlife in general as what you guys are doing. Um, so, man, I'm... Thank you for doing all that. Yep. Anybody else got anything? What? I think we're good, man. We still didn't talk about killing turkeys. I think we we talked a lot about (laughs) turkey. The turkey man. You can never talk enough about turkeys. Well, I I tell you, I I knew I knew what what, uh, Chris was all about when I pull in, I park next to his truck and he's got um I don't even know how many spurs are hanging off of his mirror, but they're all like extremely long. Not he get, enough. Yeah, not enough, he says. But, well, well, Chris, man, I, uh, you know, on behalf of all of us, you know, everybody out there listening, I think uh, if you've listened to part one and part two of what Chris, when Chris has been involved in the podcast and you didn't learn anything, it's because you wasn't paying attention. So, I mean, I would recommend going back and listening to this podcast over again, taking a, you know, take a pad and a pen and write down some notes because I promise you, you know, nothing really that I said but between Wyatt and Chris and the conversation back and forth there there's a whole lot to learn and um, I know I'm going to be listening to this thing over and over again a couple times because there's some things that uh, I know I'm going to be able to apply that make me not not just a better hunter but a better woodsman and an outdoorsman and conservationist in general yeah man pleasure to uh, pleasure to have you on and uh, even bigger pleasure to have you a friend for uh, so many years so uh appreciate you coming on and talking to us and uh you know helping us all out i think it's uh i think it's good for all of us no matter how experienced or inexperienced we are to you know just discuss some of these ideas because just because what you're doing works doesn't mean that there might not be something better so on behalf of all of us at pro talk outdoors thanks for listening and uh we'll catch you on the next one